Good morning, everyone. So the Bible reading is from Mark chapter 10, verses 35 to 45. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptised with the baptism I am baptised with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptised with the baptism I am baptised with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. May God add his blessing and understanding to the reading of his word. Right, uh, good evening everyone. So, uh, I'm subbing in <laughs> for Nick at the moment. It's Monday night, and the sermon that uh, Nick preached yesterday uh, didn't get properly recorded. <laughs> and Nick's away this week. He's got uh, he's chairperson of the Northern Presbytery. He's down in uh, Wellington on presbytery uh, business. And so he's asked me to read his sermon for you. Uh, so I'm very happy to do that. And his, his sermon is on the topic today of an attitude of service. And it's interesting because I arrived about 10 minutes ago and there was Bruce out there. He's just repainted the yellow lines out in the parking area and he's watering the plants for us and it's really hot outside. And he's out there serving the Lord. And then Bill Boyce arrives <laughs> at the end of a long day at work and jumps out of his car and runs in so that we can start recording because he's got another thing on tonight. But again, that attitude of service. So it's all around us and uh, it's a wonderful topic uh, to be talking about. So the passage is Mark 10, 35 to 45. And uh, I think Bill's already recorded the reading. Uh, so we'll go straight into the sermon. Let's pray first. Our loving God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for your precious word, the Bible. We thank you for the only sure foundation on which to build our lives. And, and Lord, we do pray that you will speak to us through your word and through this sermon that Nick has prepared. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So today uh, the topic is Attitude of Service and we're winding up the series on service. It is a big subject because Jesus talked so much about this topic and how service related to life in God's kingdom. Many of his parables related to serving and this theme was carried through into the teachings of the apostles in the rest of the New Testament. Service is an integral part of the Christian life. But having said that, perhaps sometimes it's fair to say that this theme of service can be weaponized within the church, particularly if we're short of people for a working bee somewhere. Sometimes a series like this can be a little bit like Pack up your bags, we're going on a guilt trip. And possibly that's why we had the reaction we did when I introduced this topic a month ago. It was in the first service. And I said, today we're going to start a new series. 
and everyone went, yay! <laughs> then I said, it's going to be on servanthood. And there was silence. But hopefully what you've picked up over this series is that when Jesus talked about servant service, he wasn't simply talking about service to keep our church programs running, as important as they are. He spoke about service as a part of the life of discipleship. As the Messiah, his own life was all about being a servant. He dedicated his life to serving God and to serving others. In John 5 verse 19, Jesus talked about serving God. Very truly I tell you, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his Father doing. Because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. He also talked about serving us. In Mark 10 and 45, he said, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus' life was based around service. And he expected, and he still expects, his followers to have the same attitude. Because we serve, we mature more and more into the likeness of Jesus and the person he has made us to be. Our service and our growth are connected. If we don't serve, we won't grow in Christ. It's as simple as that. Now, over the last month, we have spent time exploring some aspects of how Jesus described servanthood. In the first week, in the first week we talked about the power of serving together in unity. We talked about how God has designed us in a way that when we work together, we have the potential to do anything we put our mind to do. In the second week, we talked about the different ways that God has equipped each one of us to serve. We all have different gifts and skills and abilities that God has given us. And everything that he has given us, he has intended for us to use in his body. In the same way that Jesus used the lunch of a small boy to feed the crowd of thousands, we all have something to share. And then last week, we talked about what it means to be faithful in service. How as we offer ourselves in service, we actually begin to identify more and more with Jesus, to the point where faithfulness in service grows us in our friendship with Jesus. So that's where we've been over the last month. And this week, I want to wind it all up by looking at this passage of Mark 10, 35 to 45. Being effective in the kingdom of God is based around service rather than on power. And the back story to this passage comes toward the end of Jesus' ministry. At this time, he was at the height of popularity. The leadership of Israel were feeling threatened by him, and his disciples believed it was only a matter of time before Jesus would take political control of Israel on the back of approval of the people. So secretly, his disciples began to make plans as to what positions they would have when Jesus rose to power. And this is why the two brothers, James and John, decided on the ultimate plan. They got their mum 
to ask Jesus if her boys could have the top two roles in his new government when he took charge. But of course, when the rest of the disciples found out about James and John's approach, they were really annoyed. It could have been because they didn't think this was the right way for James and John to go, but it's probably more likely that they were angry that they hadn't thought of it themselves. Once in a while, the relationship between the apostles sounds like an episode of Survivor. Everyone playing nice together, but secretly or trying to get the top position. However, Jesus realised what was going on and decided to use this little episode as a teaching opportunity. He gathered his disciples around him and he said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. But not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. There are two things to note about this passage. First of all, Jesus understood the way the world operated. He realised that power and authority gave you influence in the world. Influence gave you leadership. Leadership gave you the ability to impose your will upon a situation. And that is certainly still true in the world we live in today. Think of some of the most powerful people in the world today. Some of them are obscenely rich and they know how to get their way most of the time. I'm thinking about the Elon Musks, the Jeff Bezos of this world, or political leaders like Mr Trump or Mr Putin or whoever the English Prime Minister is this week. The one thing they all have had or have at the moment is power. But you certainly would not think of them as servants, would you? Things were no different back in Jesus' day. Back then, being a helpful person or a kind person was not always considered an attribute to leadership. Being a driven person or someone who knew how to drive others, that was what people were looking for. The more things change, the more they stay the same. However, the second thing that Jesus said was that in God's kingdom, things operate differently. Whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. So I guess the big question is, does what Jesus say, 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 what, does what Jesus say actually work? Or is it one of those sayings that just looks good on a motivational, motivational poster, but in reality doesn't work at all? Do we recognise leaders on the basis of whether they give us results in the short term, or on whether they will be faithful to Jesus over the long term? And this can be a challenging subject for us. So I want to illustrate these differences by telling a story. Are you up for a story? And this is actually a true story about two missionaries, one called Paulinus and the other Aidan. Paulinus was a priest sent by the Church of Rome to evangelise Britain in 1400 years ago. At this stage, the church had become quite wealthy and powerful in Rome and in southern Europe, but with the exception of Ireland, most of the nations around northern Europe were not Christian at all. So Paulinus was sent over to evangelise England in the name of the church. How was he going to go about it? Well, his plan was quite a sensible three-step approach. One, find the most powerful leader 
who would listen, two, convert him, and three, get him to order everyone else to follow Jesus. Job done. Kind of makes sense, going straight to the top. So that's what Paulinus did. He came as, as an ambassador from the church in Rome, dressed in the finest robes, with the best expensive gifts that Italy had to offer. And he struck up a friendship with a young king by the name of Edwin. As a potential Christian prospect, Edwin seemed to tick all the boxes. He had a Christian wife, his advisors were friendly to the idea, and even better, as a young man, Edwin had experienced a vision while on the run from another king. In this vision, he had encountered a young man with a crown of thorns on his head, shaped like a cross. This young man promised to rescue Edwin from danger and told him in the future he would meet a teacher of the cross who he must obey. So, with all this knowledge, Paulinus was pretty confident he was on the right path. But despite this, Edwin was reluctant to become a Christian. And this reluctance continued year after year for over 20 years. Throughout this time, Paulinus continued to urge Edwin to commit his life to Jesus. All the time offering gifts and gold from Rome just to encourage him. And then one day it all came together. Edwin narrowly avoided an assassination attempt on his life. So when he recovered, Paulinus challenged him on where he was with God. To which Edwin replied, If God helps me win my upcoming battle over the King of Wessex, then I will become a Christian. And lo and behold, when Edwin returned victorious, Paulinus baptised Edwin. Then Edwin ordered all his subjects to become Christians. So Paulinus became busy baptising tens of thousands in the nearby River Glen and teaching them about Jesus. Edwin even built a massive cathedral for Paulinus, which was full one Sunday to the next, with worshippers from throughout the land. And during this season, the land was blessed. It was said over the following years of Edwin's reign that a woman could walk safely through his kingdom, from one side to the other, without getting attacked. I guess that might sound like a low bar, but in that time it was pretty important. So Edwin's empire lasted for a good long time, a full seven years, until a couple of other kings united to kill him in battle. And guess what happened to Edwin and Paulinus' Christian kingdom? It disappeared. There were some who remained faithful, the cathedral was still there, but the vast majority returned to their pagan practices, and within a short time it was like nothing had changed. So you can't argue that Paulinus had results, it's just that his results only lasted as long as the king. This leads us to the next story. Around the time of Edwin's death, there was another man who arrived in England. This man, had, this man also had a heart to reach the English people for Jesus. He was an Irish monk named Aidan. Now Aidan's approach was quite different. While Paulinus's strategy was to go to the top of society, Aidan did the opposite. He went to the bottom of society. He and his followers walked around the common folk, the villagers. And Aidan spent his time getting to know the locals, hearing their stories and sharing the gospel when invited to do so. You might have picked up that was quite different to the way Paulinus did things. 
Aidan's monks did not have the flash robes that Paulinus had. Instead, they were notable for wearing hand-me-downs and rags. And the donations they collected went back to sow directly into their communities. And then, every once in a while, as they felt God lead, Aidan would set up a community near a village called a monastery. That was how they did it in Ireland. The monasteries were led by Aidan's followers, and they were dedicated to a number of things. To worship and prayer, to healing, to educating the people of the villages with things like growing crops, reading, and technology. And, perhaps not surprisingly, people started to see that there was some advantage in having these guys around. So Aidan's monasteries started to spread throughout the English countryside. And as this continued, some of the villagers began to join the communities that met in the monasteries for worship. And as a result, churches began to be formed throughout the land. Now obviously Aidan was not known for his wealth. The Irish monks did not have that much. But one thing the monks were good at was making friends. And as they grew in popularity around the countryside, they started running into local kings, one of whom, King Oswald, became a real source of support to Aidan. He began to sponsor more of Aidan's monasteries, as they were good for the kingdom. And eventually, Oswald became a Christian. So, unlikely as it may have seemed at the beginning, it looked as if Aidan's ministry would end up having greater impact than Paulinus's. But then tragedy struck. A young pagan king by the name of Penda defeated Oswald in battle. He even dismembered Oswald's body, taking parts of his body all around Oswald's kingdom to discourage anyone in the villages to rebel against him. At first, this looked like it could be the worst thing that could have happened to the mission field in England. But interestingly, this time, under the leadership of Aidan, things were different. This time, the church held strong. In fact, it didn't just hold strong, it continued to grow. And over the next few hundred years, monasteries like Aidan's began to spread throughout England, Scandinavia, and the rest of Northern Europe. The, the reason Western Europe became a civilized Christian nation was due to the Irish. Who would have thought? But what was the difference between Aidan and Paulinus in their approaches to leadership? I think it is fair to say that God used both of them to one degree or another. But why did one's work take root while the others withered away? Perhaps it had something to do with the way they understood leadership. Paulinus tended to put his faith in the power of riches and the influence of a king. But Aidan lived the life of a servant, fully trusting that God would work through him and his disciples if they lived the way Jesus had commanded them to live. The church historian, known as the Venerable Bede, who wasn't known to be a great fan of the Irish Christians, described Aidan in this way. Aidan's teaching won the hearts of everyone because he taught what he and his followers lived out. He neither sought nor cared for the possessions of this world, and he loved to give away to the poor the gifts he received from the rich. How's that for a testimony? This was the testimony about a person who lived to serve. That was who Aidan was. His approach to life was based in the way of God's kingdom rather than in the way of the world. It was a demonstration of Jesus' teaching that effective leadership 
comes through humbling ourselves to serve other people. This is the way that lasts the distance. As we saw in the story of Paulinus, leadership that comes from use of power or wealth, while it may look effective in the short term, it will not go the distance. So let's bring this home. How do we understand leadership? When we think about effective leadership, whether it be in the home or at work or at church, how do we understand it? Do we exercise leadership by power or by the way we serve others? This is not simply a rule for our behaviour on a Sunday. Jesus was saying this as a guiding principle for our lives. How we commit ourselves to serving other people matters. Whether it is serving our wife or our husband, our children, our workmates, the people next to us in church, the people we encounter in our day-to-day -day lives, like those at the checkout counter. How do we understand our role here as servants? Or are we here to be served? Do we do what we do because it is convenient for us? Or are we willing to inconvenience ourselves for the people that God has placed around us? As I said at the outset of this series, as a church we are so blessed with people who have been willing to give their lives over in service. But it is important that we learn to recognise the why we do these things. We serve to grow together as the body of Christ. We serve to develop the gifts that God has given each one of us. We serve to identify with Jesus, the one who came to serve us. And we serve because this is the way God brings the influence of the kingdom of heaven to the places around us. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, we are here because of what you have done for us. You were the one who opened the door of salvation to us and carried the burden of our sin and shame. The freedom and the opportunities we have now are because you bent down to lift us up. So, with that in mind, help us to live our lives with your servant heart that the impact we bring would not be our own damaged ego but your love fleshed out in our actions that your kingdom would be installed in the people and the places around us and onward into all eternity and we pray this in Jesus precious name Amen <laughs>